everyone, this is Danai, and today we will be talking about one of the most played pieces of piano solo repertoire. It is one that you guys have requested multiple times, and I think probably most of you have also played this piece. It is the Prelude in C major from the Prelude and Fugue in C major from the Well-Tempered Clavier by Johann Sebastian Bach. It's the first prelude of the cycle, incredibly famous piece. It starts like this. And today we will be discussing my thoughts on how to play this, what to look out for, how to interpret the piece musically. Technically, it's fairly simple, but there are still many things to look out for. What I love about this piece is that it is very inclusive in a way. A beginner can play it because technically it's not that hard, but it's also just as interesting for a professional pianist and also challenging because you want to make it very special. In a way, it's also a bit of a holy grail of piano repertoire. So it is really a piece that anyone can play and it is interesting and exciting to discover for a piano player of any level. So if you're interested in listening to my thoughts on this piece, then keep on watching. let's briefly talk about historically informed playing. Because this is a Baroque piece by Johann Sebastian Bach, and obviously it was not composed for this modern piano that I have right here, it was composed for a harpsichord. So it is definitely interesting to just touch on this topic, especially because the opinions differ a lot when it comes to that. Should we play it as if we were playing on a harpsichord? Should it sound as if it were played on a harpsichord? Or should we use all the means that the modern piano can offer. So this really is a divide and musicians go into both ways and I think both ways are also very valid. My personal opinion is that if you choose to play this piece on a modern piano, it is definitely fine to also utilize the new features that the modern piano gives us compared to the harpsichord because you're playing it on this instrument and I believe that the composers, including Bach, would have also wanted us to use the new means that this instrument offers. So I wouldn't say you have to play it on the piano just like it is on the harpsichord. However, I do think that it is very important and very interesting to know what was possible on the harpsichord, to know what it sounded like on the harpsichord, and maybe let that influence your interpretation. So having said that, during my studies, I actually had a course on historically informed practice and was also able to play harpsichords, uh, pianofortes, hammer claviers for several years and practice on them, which was incredibly interesting and I found very, very helpful for my piano playing on modern pianos as well. So I'm going to mention some of these things that I learned in that course here as well. So my very first topic that I want to touch on is tempo. When talking about the tempo, I feel like it is interesting to consider the harpsichord because on the harpsichord, the way that the harpsichord works is that the string is actually plucked. It's not like with our modern piano, there's no hammer that is going against the string and then it starts vibrating. It's actually plucked, which of course makes the sound much, much shorter. Now when we touch the key and then the string starts vibrating, it goes on and on and on for a very long time. With the harpsichord, the sound is gone fairly quickly. So this is why also historically informed players very often tend to play faster tempi because probably back then people would play it faster. Now for this piece, there are interpretations that I hear sometimes that are incredibly slow and I have to honestly say I don't like it. Again, this is a matter of taste and if someone plays it in a convincing way with a slow tempo, that's fine. But just sharing my personal opinion, I'm not a fan of playing this too slowly. So this type of a tempo is not really my thing. I believe that we can definitely have in mind the harpsichord, the way the sound development works on that instrument and adapt the tempo here. So this is why I would opt for this type of a tempo. Mm -hmm. 
it might be on the faster side compared to the thousands of recordings that there are of this piece, but I believe that this piece also needs a certain type of flow in order to sound interesting and in order to make it sound like it is one complete circle that starts in the beginning and then goes until the end because the pattern goes on and on it's never broken in the final bars there's a tiny bit of a change but basically this pattern goes through the entire piece so this is why i would suggest a bit of a more fluent tempo now another important point that i want to mention to me personally it's probably the most important one is the simplicity. I find that this piece in particular is an example of how simplicity can be magical. Very often when we have a piece that is somehow seems simple or looks simple like this one does simply because the pattern is always the same, we want to start making it sound special and we want to start, I don't know, doing rubatos, doing some extreme dynamics, putting in extreme things but I don't believe that this is what this piece calls for. What makes this piece so magical and so beautiful is its simplicity. And my teacher always used to say, just play what is written in the score. He would say, Danai, please don't make this into something that it isn't. Just play what is written in the score and that's how it's going to sound the best. And that is actually pretty good advice. Just take the score and try to play exactly what is written in the score. So first of all, pretty rhythmical. No crazy rubato stuff. Simple dynamic. Yes, of course, it needs to go up and down, but there is a, a type of simplicity there. And I also feel that this is one of the pieces that sometimes a young child will somehow intuitively play pretty well simply because it's not overthinking it. So don't try to overthink it, especially if you're already an advanced player, but just try to play the simplicity and that's probably when you're going to hit the sweet spot and when it's going to sound the best. Of course, I'm aware that when I say just play it simple and just leave the simplicity, that's much easier said than done. So, of course, I'm going to give you some more pointers, but I think it's important to keep in mind to just let it sound simple because that's where the beauty is in this prelude. Now, before I mentioned to keep it simple rhythmically and dynamically, but as always, if you are already playing something pretty regular and keeping it simple, it is the exceptions that make the rule and that make it beautiful. So of course the entire piece should not be the same dynamic. I would definitely not recommend that. Again, this is something that is possible on the modern piano. It's not possible on the harpsichord. You cannot change dynamics on the harpsichord. So some people might tell me, well, you have to play every note exactly the same because that's how it would sound on the harpsichord. However, I'm not a fan of that. I would suggest to actually create phrasing the way we can on the modern piano. So, for example, just taking the beginning, um, if I play it in chords, which by the way is something that I would recommend that you do anyway with this piece, play the whole piece in chords. So... And so on and so on, just so that you can hear where the phrase goes, what the harmonic progression actually feels and sounds like. Because if you play the entire piece in chords, you will already have a pretty good idea of where the phrasing should go, where you can open up a bit, where you close again. So I think that that can be a very good exercise. And just taking the first four bars, which are... It's already pretty obvious that it is what we call a hairpin. So it opens up and then it closes back down. You start here, opening up. This is probably the highest point and then the resolution goes back. And when playing the piece, I would definitely do that. Not to an extreme, but a little bit. that happen throughout the entire piece. Just to name a few more examples, there is a type of a sequence that comes just after that, starting in the fifth bar, A minor, and then I would go down. Then G major, and then I would go down. 
So for example, a sequence like that is something that you can highlight dynamically. And then in the end, there is quite a big crescendo, I feel that is developing until the final bars where you have. it like this so don't mind my posture right now it's just to demonstrate for the video but I feel like there the crescendo leading up to these final bars can also be pretty obvious something that goes hand in hand with the dynamics is timing or what we would call rubato which is the slight pulling and pushing of time within the beat of course you're not supposed to fundamentally change the beat or um, become faster or slower. However, a bit of rubato is always possible. And I want to mention that when you're playing a harpsichord, rubato is actually the way that you mimic dynamics. Because you cannot actually play louder and softer, very often there will be a rubato. So for example, you're going to become slower and really prepare a chord in order to make it sound more grave or louder in a way and then when something becomes softer so to speak you'll just play it quite quickly so that it sounds as if you just quickly um, brushed over it so rubato is something that harpsichord players used much more probably than we do on the modern piano because we have the ability to change the sound and influence the sound dynamically as a substitute for the rubato of course we also use rubato but um, it's also important to keep that in mind, the type of rubato that a harpsichord player would use. So, for example, we always have in the left hand the two bass notes. The first one, which is held throughout the entire half bar, and the second one, which from the moment that it is pressed is also held throughout the entire half bar. And I feel like it's important to give those a certain emphasis, especially when there are important harmonic changes. So for example, if we're going from bar 11 to 12, we're going from this to this, which is a pretty substantial change. And the left hand is playing G, B, and then G, B flat, which kind of introduces the new color. So I would take a tiny bit of time for that. if you take that time you can make up for it in the right hand so that in the end you have the same beat another tiny rubato to consider is to sometimes emphasize the highest note this is also very common something that you would do on the harpsichord so if the highest note seems important to you for example towards the end there is a chromatic line in the highest note highlight that then you can prepare that highest note so keep in mind that the rubato can be used for special moments where you want to emphasize something and it always is more effective if you generally keep it simple and then reserve the rubato for the special moments as opposed to using a rubato in every single bar because then it's not special anymore and another topic that I want to touch on is the pedal. Of course, another very controversial topic when it comes to Bach. Should we use the pedal? Obviously, harpsichord doesn't have a pedal. Or should we play it staccato or anything like that? Again, I think we should use the pedal if we have it and if we are playing it on the modern piano. We should, of course, be aware that it's not a romantic piece and we shouldn't use the pedal as if it were Rachmaninoff. But still, using it to enhance the atmosphere, I believe, is not a sin. <laughs> it's not something that should be forbidden. So I do use it a bit. Of course, I very clearly change it when the harmony changes. And I also don't hold it throughout the entire harmony. Sometimes I slightly filter it out by kind of vibrating like this with my foot and filtering it out a bit. So you can play around with that. I find that a refined use of the pedal can really help you a lot with the sound, can create very magical sound colors and sound worlds. So I would definitely encourage you to play around with the pedal a little bit. 
but I would definitely say use it. Make sure to change it clearly. When the harmony changes, you don't want that harmony to go over into this harmony and sound like this. That's not what Bach is at all, but use it a bit within the harmony. Another little tip is that there is something called finger pedal, which you can also use, which basically simply means that you hold the keys with your fingers and thereby create a pedal effect. So um, you can go and you just hold it instead of lifting. It's a bit of a different way of playing and I wouldn't recommend it for the entire piece, but just also as a technique to have in mind, sometimes it might also be a nice alternative to use a bit of finger pedal or if you just want one note to stay and not the entire harmony to not make it sound too thick. So these were my very general thoughts on the Prelude in C major by Johann Sebastian Bach. It is such a beautiful piece and I'm very curious to hear your thoughts. Are you a fan of playing it very historically informed as if it were played on a harpsichord or are you a fan of transferring this piece to the modern piano? Let me know your experience with it. Let me know your favorite recordings of it. There are so many. I think everyone probably has a relationship to this piece. So it's very interesting to hear all of your different opinions. I'm going to look forward to reading your comments on that. If you enjoyed this video, please leave it a like and subscribe to my channel. That would help me a lot. And I wish you a wonderful week and we'll see you again in the next video. Bye.